Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for coming. I we're delighted to welcome you to the continuation of our cancer education series. Uh, as you may know, we have some refreshments out at the back. Please help yourself after the uh, lecture. The topics chosen for these lectures are intended for general education about cancer and to give insight into the expanding cancer care services here at the Stronach Regional Cancer Center and now available locally and closer to home for the residents of Newmarket and surrounding areas. The topics we select are often based on feedback we receive from completed evaluation forms. Therefore, I encourage you to complete this evening's evaluation form either on paper or online on those little cards that are handouts. If you need more information, please drop by the reception desk outside and there's literature out there to help you. As many of you know, lectures are held on the last Tuesday of selected months. Presentations are made by a number of highly skilled healthcare professionals covering the broad aspects of cancer care, including prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and symptom management. They are also an effective way to learn more about the latest technologies and services offered by Stronach Regional Cancer Center. Tonight's lecture topic is lung cancer. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the doctor's presentation, so please hold your questions until then. For tonight's presentation, I am delighted and privileged to introduce two doctors, uh, Dr. Peter Anglin and Moji Taremi. Our first speaker is Dr. Peter Anglin. He obtained his medical degree in 1986 from Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, and between 86 and 87, he completed his internship at the Ottawa Civic Hospital. Dr. Anglin subsequently earned clinical fellowships in internal medicine, University of Ottawa, 89 to 92, hematology, University of Toronto, 92 to 94, and oncology at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, 1994 to 95. He has, over the past 15 years, been involved in clinical practice in the greater Toronto area as staff hematologist oncologist with the Rouge Valley Health System, 95 to 2001, staff physician at Princess Margaret Cancer Center, 99 to 2000, and staff hematologist at the Credit Valley Hospital, 2001 to 07, and is staff hematologist at the Princess Margaret Hospital and is currently medical director, medical oncology program here at the Stronach Regional Cancer Center. He actively participates in several committees dealing with cancer care and clinical trials. He also holds an MBA from the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Peter Anglin. I feel old. <laughs> um, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for the organizers for asking me to speak. Um, <clears throat> I, I treat a number of malignancies, one of them being lung cancer. Uh, at the Stronach Cancer Center, um, we're a very active lung cancer uh, hospital because we've got three thoracic surgeons that operate a lot, and a lot, and our regional referral area for malignancies of the chest is is rather large. So we really are, are a very busy site. And there's three or four of us uh, as medical oncologists that see patients with lung cancer. Dr. Tremi, you'll meet after me. She'll give you the radiation side of things as well. So this really is going to be lung cancer 101, just a review. And so <clears throat> whether you're friend, family, family member, or patient, uh, when you see some of this, hopefully it'll resonate a little bit with what you've learned. Uh, this is something none of you wanted to learn about, but you've been forced to learn a little bit to, to cope and deal with it. And so hopefully, again, information brings empowerment, and that'll give you a little bit of help. Um, today, I'm going to give you some, a little few statistics. We'll talk about symptoms. I'll talk about the two broad classes of lung cancer, and then I'll give you um, a little bit of information on how we stage disease. Uh, and then I'll talk just simply how we approach it at a high level. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about surgery, and then Moji's going to talk about radiation, and I'll tell you a little bit about chemotherapy. Now, lung cancer, well, it's, it's the fourth most common. Is there a pointer, or does not matter? I can use my finger. Um, it's a, there's 64,000 cancers a year in Ontario, but lung cancer, it's only about 12% of them. So about, in Ontario, about 8,000 people a year get lung cancer. The problem with lung cancer is it kills a lot of people. It's, a, it's, an, it's an aggressive malignancy. 
And so, oh, that works. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, if you look at five-year survivals for tumors, look, if you have prostate cancer, people, 97% of people live five years. Colon and rectal cancer, about two-thirds of people live five years. Lung cancer is more of a challenge. About 20% or so of people live five years. So it has been a challenging malignancy for us to manage. We are improving. We do cure patients, but it is a more challenging cancer to treat. Um, in terms of how people present with lung cancer, you may recognize this, that's a chest x-ray. And in the middle of the chest, so uh, right here is the heart, but this lump shouldn't be there. And that's what a lung mass might look like in someone with a lung cancer. And generally when people come to medical attention, it's because they've been coughing or short of breath or coughed up some blood or have some pain. And those are the local symptoms you might have of a growth in the chest. At the same time, some people present with weakness and weight loss and loss of appetite, and that's because lung cancer can give you generalized symptoms or can spread and cause symptoms all through the body. So there's a whole variety of symptoms that, pe that bring people to medical attention. What does happen is eventually you have a chest x-ray, generally, and you see a lump on the chest and that leads to further investigations. What we hope and what we're working on is the period from when you see your doctor and get that first x-ray and find something there, that we want to make it very fast and seamless how quickly you're seen, imaged, biopsied, and a treatment plan is formulated. And just so you know, a lot of efforts are going in to make that whole period from this chest x-ray to when you get on your first treatment faster and more seamless. Cancer Care Ontario is doing a lot of work for that, and we at the Regional Cancer Centre are as well. We do a number of investigations to when someone has a lung mass, and that includes a bronchoscopy where we look inside. I'll show you a couple pictures. We do biopsies, and we do additional x-rays, CAT scans and things, to find out what the extent of the tumor is. We call that staging. Some of you may recall blowing pulmonary function tests where you blow into a, into a tube to, get the, to see how well your lungs function, because we not only... When we formulate a plan for a lung cancer, we need to know what kind of lung cancer it is, how extensive the tumor is, and how functional the patient is, because that affects how we choose treatments. This is a diagram. It's a dramatic diagram of a bronchoscopy, but sometimes the best way to sort out a growth in the lung is to look right inside, and you can see a tumor and take a biopsy. It. So that's a very common test that we do when we're investigating a lung mass. Uh, we do some CAT scans, and some of you may have experiences with that, and that's just an example. That's, some, that's what a CAT scanner, it's a big donut. And then the pictures tend to be cross-sectional pictures. So when you look at these pictures, if you just follow my arrow, that's the front and that's the back. And that's the right lung and that's the left lung. And this lump shouldn't be there, so that's a mass in the left lung. And when we do a CAT scan, it allows us to look at the structures at the center of the chest. A lot of these are blood vessels. But we're allow, it allows us to see if you've got enlarged lymph nodes like this, for example, that help us staging and help us formulate our approach to a lung cancer. <clears throat> Sometimes we use, you have very small lumps in the chest, and we'll do biopsies of those, lung, of those lumps with a needle under CAT scan guidance, and that's quite common. We do that here quite commonly as well. Um, a lot of people have heard of something called PET scans, which is sort of <clears throat> something we have available. For PET scans, we send patients to Sunnybrook, but generally we can get PET scans within 10 to 14 days. And what a PET scan does is sometimes when you do, this is an example of a CAT scan, but sometimes we'll see lumps on a CAT scan and we're not sure if those represent malignancy or scar or something else. And so a PET scan helps to determine if a lump that we see, say like this, is cancer or not. And so we'll do the CAT scan, a PET scan, and then we'll merge the two. And this can say, gee, that's glowing. And there's some glowing down there. So this is a tumor that's spread to the adrenal gland. And since we know it's spread, it will allow us to formulate the right approach. In this case, the patient should not go to the operating room because to put them through that resection would not help. And then we'd look at other options like chemotherapy, etc. So we have access to PET scan, and we do incorporate that into our staging examinations here at Southlake. We do it, not all patients require a PET scan, is the first thing, because sometimes we can clearly formulate our approach without the PET. And the second thing is no test is perfect, and everyone, while PET scans are kind of the most sophisticated imaging tests that we have access to, no test is perfect. 
And sometimes the more sophisticated the test, the more little things you find that confuse you. So just to let you know that. But, but we do have access to PET and use them quite regularly to stage lung cancer. Um, this is probably as complicated as I get, but in lung cancer, there's just two major types. One is small cell lung cancer, which is about a fifth of lung cancers, or 20%. And then there's non-small cell lung cancer. So when pathologists were classifying lung cancer 40 and 50 years ago under the microscope, they noticed that one group had awful small cells and all the one other ones had big cells. So they just split them that way. And we've clung to that separation. The reason we have is small cell lung cancer behaves very much differently than this one. This is largely treated with chemotherapy and we rarely operate. This one, surgery is what we do to cure it. So they're very different and so emphasizing again pathology, sorting out what the pathology is, is very important. Under non-small cell lung cancer there are different types of tumors. The most common being something called adenocarcinoma, but I don't want to get bogged down in details. And this is what, when we do biopsies, we, have, we send them off to the pathologist, and the pathologists help differentiate whether they're small cell or a non-small cell lung cancer. And while I may make it look a little bit easier here, it sometimes is not so easy, and the pathologist can use a variety of special techniques to help determine what kind of tumor is in the lung. The next step is when we've done a biopsy on a lump and we've decided that it's a type of lung cancer is we need to stage you by doing x-rays and I've shown you some x-rays. And the reason there's different stages of lung cancer, and I think I'll just walk out, but the simplest way to think of it is as, you know, a single tumor is a stage one tumor and then a stage two tumor involves a few lymph nodes. But all of these tumors are potentially resectable. So if this is non-small cell lung cancer and we stage it like this, then we, the surgeons take you to the operating room, assuming you're fit enough to have a surgery to take off the lung. And that's the best way to cure lung cancer, okay, is to cut out, cut out the tumor. Now, as tumors have more advanced stage, and the biggest difference here is when we do all these fancy stages, we're trying to establish, <coughs> excuse me, if there's... Uh, other tumors, and once you start getting lymph nodes involved by tumor around the main airway. Um, so for, for patients, when you start getting involvement centrally, that's when technically it's more difficult to cut out. And if we can't cut the tumor out, it really changes the way we approach your lung cancer. And so that's why sometimes it's frustrating. It takes two, three, sometimes four weeks to go through all of these tests, but you want to get it right because you want to operate on the right people and you, you, you don't want to operate on the right people. You want to separate that out. And so we try to do the best we can to stage people so then we can approach what we do. All of the staging largely applies for the 80% of non-small cell lung cancers. For small cell lung cancer, it's very simple. It's either limited stage in the chest or it's extensive stage outside of the chest to be ballpark for you. So it's a much easier tumor to sort of stage in terms of um, the different classifications. So, uh, you know, we've done a biopsy, we've done a full staging workup, and the next decision is, can a patient be operated on? I've shown you that if they have, you know, not too much disease and it's not into the chest, then you can operate. Uh, and if you have involvement of the central lymph nodes, you can't. <clears throat> Sometimes tumors of the lung can invade into the chest wall or other structures. And in those cases, you can't operate right away. Sometimes you need to shrink them down with chemotherapy and radiation. And the last reason not to operate is if you have this thing called small cell lung cancer, which is one fifth of lung tumors. Because those tends to be, those tumors tend to disseminate from the start. And the best treatment for those are, are chemotherapy and then radiation if the tumor is localized. So if it's small cell lung cancer, you don't get an operation. You see someone like myself and Moji, Dr. Taremi, and you get some chemotherapy and radiation, and we try to cure it that way. So the importance of type of tumor, staging, and how fit the patient is to tolerate this complex mix of treatments of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, and so there's a lot that goes into that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. As I mentioned then, if you have non-small cell lung cancer, ideally your tumor is stage 1 or stage 2, meaning it's not involving the central lymph nodes and hasn't spread anywhere. If that's the case, you'll see one of our three chest surgeons and they'll take you to the operating room and do 
take out various parts of your lung, like a little wedge or, a, well, something called a segment or a whole lobe, or sometimes they can take out a whole lung, depending on how fit you are and how much they need to do. Uh, so that's the surgery part. I, the surgery part today is very short, because I'm a medical oncologist and Dr. Tremi is a radiation oncologist, and we don't have the third, probably most important person, the surgeons here to talk as well. But uh, they're the ones who, who cure, but they don't do it without our help. Um, I'm now going to focus, <coughs> excuse me, I'm now going to focus just a little bit on chemotherapy and lung cancer. Dr. Tremi will address radiation. We use chemotherapy sometimes before surgery, sometimes we give it after surgery, and most commonly I use chemotherapy when a tumor cannot be cut out and uh, is probably not curable. And in those circumstances, to try to control the tumor for a period of time, give quality of life to people before the tumor um, grows and becomes a problem. Um, I'm going to talk about non-small cell lung cancer. That's about 80% of lung cancers to start. So that they're the most common thing that we see. Um, Sometimes I mentioned, you saw my picture. So patients, hopefully if you've got tumor limited to your chest, you can go to a surgeon and get the tumor cut out. Um, we'll, you'll come to someone like me afterwards for a discussion about chemotherapy because we know if we cut a tumor out, there's a reasonable chance it might come back. And that's because there can be microscopic cells within you that may not be seen by our staging examinations. And it's been shown that in certain circumstances, if we give a bit of chemotherapy after a tumor has been cut out, that you may have a better chance of remaining free of your lung cancer. We use that term, we call it adjuvant chemotherapy. We do it for colon cancer after the colon cancer is cut out. We do it for breast cancer. And we do it now for lung cancer after it's been cut out. But again, only in selected circumstances. Because we have to balance the evidence of giving you a little bit of benefit with the toxicity of chemotherapy. And I'll just show you one example of what I mean by that. Um, this looks a little bit confusing, but this person... Well, I'm not supposed to wander away. So I keep wanting to wander away. So this is someone who had what we call a stage 2A tumor cutout. They had some lymph nodes cut out, and the tumor may have been, say, 3 or 4 centimeters. But they had positive lymph nodes. And we know if we gave that person no additional therapy, so that you cut the tumor out and then you just wait, about 48% of people over time would still recur with that tumor. So even though we resect the lung cancer, we watch it pretty closely because there's some chance that the tumor can come back. What we have learned is if we give some chemotherapy after that, we can diminish that chance of recurrence some. Not a guarantee, but some. And in fact, what we diminish, instead of about 48% of patients succumbing to the cancer, if we give you some chemotherapy at maybe 41%. This is using a calculation. So people, I can't wander away. Um, people often say, well, is there really a benefit to taking chemotherapy to have a 7% absolute improvement in survival? And I can tell you from doing this now for almost 20 years, probably 90% of people say, okay, what do I do? <laughs> How many cycles is it? That kind of thing. Um, and so that's why sometimes we give chemotherapy after tumors have been cut out because large studies have shown some benefit and better outcome if you get some chemotherapy. Um, <coughs> and I'll talk about chemotherapy specifically. Chemo, um, not all patients can be operated on, as I mentioned. So if you have involvement of the chest, the lymph nodes in the center of the chest, or if the tumor spread beyond the chest, sometimes you'll get chemotherapy and radiation, or sometimes you'll get chemotherapy alone. Now, just what does chemotherapy mean for um, lung cancer? Well, there's different types of chemotherapy. And these days, there's actually chemotherapy pills that we can give you. That's probably only applicable in about 15% of patients. If patients have incurable cancer, and one important thing with lung cancer is to acknowledge at a point with the patient and their family when you're not able to cure it and talk clearly about goals, which is quality of life and length of life. That said, there are treatments that we can give that can improve quality of life and sometimes length of life in those circumstances. Um, when we give chemotherapy, it's often by vein. It's often every two or three weeks. People get it as an outpatient here. 
There are side effects with it, include thinning of hair, tingling of the nerves, blood counts can be depressed, and there's sometimes there's fatigue. But on the balance, and what I emphasize to patients, is often patients can feel better, tumors can shrink, and you can potentially live longer. So that's the balance of it. As with any treatment, some patients are more sensitive to it than others. This, the, this is just a diagram to emphasize that nowadays we are doing, um, we are in the age of looking at the DNA of tumors and looking to assess their specificity for specific treatments. We call it targeted therapy, personalized medicine or personalized treatment. And so here at South Lake, we are doing what the rest of the province is. And if I saw you down at Princess Margaret Hospital, it would be the same approach. We, we test your tumor for certain things like EGFR and ALK mutations. That's what I have here. And that will determine your um, candidacy potentially for pills or newer cutting edge therapies that may shrink that tumor down. And we send all tumors that are appropriate for that testing, and that's with a big cooperation, a lot of cooperation from our pathology department. I don't have a call, I just want to make sure I'm done in about two minutes. <laughs> um, what are, yeah, I'll just go on. So here's an example of someone with an advanced lung cancer who was treated with a pill. And the first image here, this is when they came in, and they, they had, uh, something called the EGFR mutation, and they got treated with a pill once a day, and that's their CAT scan over there two months later. Now, one looks better than the other because the tumors have shrunk down, so that's the kind of thing we're achieving with pills now, all right? And we're, and we're making more and more headway all the time. Um, with lung cancer, if you do have lung cancer, we have a whole bunch of different types of chemotherapies to give you. There are fairly standard algorithms. You try one treatment if it works, you do it for a while, take a break, then you start a different treatment when there's progression. So we have a number of different ways and drugs to treat metastatic or lung cancer that has spread now. And I've just put a few names of some of the drugs. Again, all of these that we have available here for our patients. Small cell lung cancer, I mentioned the way we treat it is with chemotherapy. That tends to be a more aggressive cancer. Um, I put some statistics here. You see, if you've got small cell lung cancer that's spread, the two-year survival there is less than 5%. What I'll tell you is that last 10 years ago, I treated with a woman who had extensive stage small cell lung cancer in bone and her liver, and last night she made me a spaghetti dinner. So just to let, so I always tell patients there are these statistics and. So not that we want to give you a lot of statistics, but it's important in our responsibility as oncologists to be realistic what the numbers are so it can allow you to frame with your own frame of reference how you want to approach the treatment. But, you know, you see these numbers less than 5%, but I can tell you they're around because one of them made me a spaghetti dinner last night. Um, um, and small cell lung cancer can respond very well to chemotherapy. There's an example of a large tumor excuse me, um, before chemotherapy and over there you can see that big thing in the middle has shrunk down. So that's kind of what we say when we're in clinic too, the big thing has shrunk down. And generally that correlates with people feeling better, breathing better, better quality of life, which is what we want to achieve. This is my last slide. For chemotherapy now, we are in a position working with Princess Margaret Hospital where we are starting to, in patients with advanced tumors, have them go down to Princess Margaret Hospital. They will get a consent done, and then Princess Margaret Hospital will do a variety of tests looking at the DNA of your tumors to look at every possibility that may have you line up for a new cutting edge treatment. This program we've just implemented in the last one or two weeks, and so it's not for everybody. So not every patient you see, we're saying here, fill out the form and go down to PMH. But just to let you know, again, patients at South Lake are getting having access to really cutting edge um, methodologies to make sure that uh, you have every opportunity you can to do the make the best of you can of what can be challenging circumstances. So I think my segue now is to Dr. Taremi, who's going to talk about radiation. Well, our second, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Anglin, that's very good. Our second speaker is uh, Moji, Dr. Moji Taremi. Do, uh, Dr. Taremi is a specialist in radiation oncology program from the Royal College of Canada. 
Dr. Turemi is a subspecialist in treating lung cancer with stereotactic radiotherapy and is the staff radiation oncologist at the Stronach Regional Cancer Center and the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Her main professional interests are intensity modulated radiotherapy and image guided radiotherapy, late toxicity of lung stereotactic treatment, PET scan in assessment of lung cancer outcome. I hope I got that right. Please welcome Dr. Moji Turan. Now that Dr. Anglan talked about chemotherapy, I'm going to talk about some indications about the radiotherapy for treating the patients with lung cancer. We can treat lung cancer, both small cell and non-small cell lung carcinoma, with a radical dose, which means high dose of radiotherapy, to obtain the best local control. Also, we can offer radiotherapy after surgical excision. As Dr. Angela mentioned, some patients go for surgical excision, but there is sometimes residual disease left behind. These are the patients that they can also get radiation to clean up the area of residual disease, also to the midline chest. But unfortunately, the majority of patients actually present with advanced disease to the point that we cannot uh, give the high dose radiotherapy. We still need to treat these patients for symptom management. Some of these patients have local symptoms which means the symptoms related to their lung disease, cough, shortness of breath, coughing up blood, and some have symptoms related to distant metastasis, such as bone pain related to the cancer spread to the bone. And finally, we can treat the metastatic spots, such as brain lesions. Here is the example of a stage three non-small cell lung carcinoma, the black spot here. This is lung, it's full of air, that's why it's black. The white stuff here, these are the vessels, and this is the tumor at the middle of the lung. We call it a stage three simply because it's gone through the lymph node. Usually for a stage three, non-small cell lung carcinoma, typically we treat them with high dose radiation within 30 to 33 days, but there are various dose fractionations. Now, here is the example of small cell lung carcinoma. In comparison with the previous case, we can see that there is extensive disease. Here there are leaf nodes encasing the airways. This host, this black dot here is the airway. And these are all the lymph nodes. And there is fluid here in this right lung, less fluid to the left lung. So bottom line, a small cell lung carcinoma present with very advanced disease. And that's why they usually need chemotherapy to start with, but if they have a small volume, we can also treat them with radi radiotherapy at the same time of um, chemotherapy, but the dose is smaller just because these kind of tumors are extremely sensitive to radiation and to chemotherapy. <laughs> As I mentioned, majority of patients actually present with localized symptoms, and we don't aim to treat them with high-dose radiation. Here is the airway, airway bifurcates into right lung and left lung. Around the airways, we have high supply of blood vasculature and also from lymphatic. Obviously, patients may cough, cough to the point that actually they cough up blood, and they may have shortness of breath. Radiation can help both for shortness of breath and bleeding. Here you can see the tumor at the midline structure. These two little black spots are airways, and as we can see, the tumor encasing the airways. At this point, patients may present with cough, shortness of breath, or even coughing up blood. And if we don't stop this process, this airway may actually narrow and narrow to the point that it gets completely closed up. Lung is really like the balloon. If there is no air going there, the lung will collapse. And here we can see the whole lung is collapsed. On the left side, you can see that the chest is full of air. That's why it's black. On the right side, you can see it's all white spot here. And that seems the lung is collapsed all here. At this point, usually patients have severe shortness of breath, and they may not even respond to treatment. Unfortunately, lung cancer has tendency to go to the brain. And if the patient presents with single brain lesion without any disease anywhere else, such as this case, 
then we can be more aggressive. We can send the patient for surgical excision. Uh, here we can see the tumor with significant edema, the black spot around this tumor, they're just all edema. And the surgeon can remove the tumor as much as it's safe for the patient. Obviously, the surgeon cannot remove the brain because the side effects would be unacceptable. So they remove as much as they can, then the patient can get some high-dose radiation around the tumor or even through the whole brain. But if the patient presents with multiple lesions, such as this case, and there's no point to send them for surgery or treat them with high-dose radiation, then we treat them with full whole brain radiation, one being from one side, one being from the other side, and treat the whole brain, basically. Here we treat the lesion with the focused high-dose radiation, so-called gamma knife therapy. That can also be used, for, especially for patients who do not want to go for surgery, or they're not a candidate for surgical excision. The other indication for radiotherapy is really to manage the pain when the cancer goes to the bone. Here, we can see the bone. The black spot here is basically the tumor that has replaced the normal structure of the bone, and we can see it like as if it, there is a hole in the bone. Here, there is a black spot here. And again, if we don't stop this process, or if we don't fix it, unfortunately, the patient may actually present with a fracture, and then they need to have orthopedic surgeon to go there and fix the bone, and then we offer some radiation after the procedure to help the pain. Even though that this looks quite serious, it still is treatable, and we can still improve the quality of life. Not all the conditions are as straightforward. For example, here, the tumor has gone through the vertebral body. Here is the vertebral body. This white spot here is a normal bony structure. The black spot here is the tumor and has gone through the cord. At the middle of vertebral body, we have a spinal cord. And the spinal cord, obviously, if it gets under compression, patients develop some symptoms. What kind of symptoms? pain, numbness, tingling, and if the tumor really becomes advanced, they may lose the ability to walk, or they may have significant problem with the bowel movement or urination. In this MRI image, we can see that some spots, the white spots, are the tumor. Here we can see the white spots here, and they're okay. They're not close to a spinal cord, but here, this part, the tumor, is very close to the cord, and it's squeezing the cord. Here, this image shows that the tumor is really compressing through the cord. Again, if we don't stop this process, the patient, unfortunately, may become paralyzed because the cord gets under too much compression, the blood vasculature gets completely compressed, there is ischemia, and eventually that part of cord becomes damaged. If there is just one level and the rest of the body looks okay, the surgeon may get in there and then fix the bones with the surgical intervention, and then we can offer some radiation afterward. So we talked about indication of radiation, but how can we do that? The first step before radiation is basically mapping session. Mapping session is to obtain some images so we can delineate the line around the area that we want to treat. Here at the Stronos Regional Cancer Center, we get those images through CT scan, and that's called CT SIM. And the other problem that we have with lung, which is actually a good thing, is the fact that we breathe in and out. When we breathe in and out, the tumor also moves, so we have to consider this motion when we treat the lung cancer. So we get some images in maximum exhale, maximum inhale, we fuse them to encompass this motion. Here in this, oh yeah, there you go, sorry. I pressed something by mistake. Here, here on this image, we can see the graph that shows maximum inhale and uh, exhale, and then we fuse them to get, the, uh, to get the motion of the lung and then encompass that for the tumor motion. So this is the example of the patient with not a small cell, right upper lung cancer. Here is the cancer at the upper part of the chest. Again, as I said, the black spot here, the whole black thing is the lung. This area has tumor, 
and the tumor has gone to the midline structure around the airways. So this is the image that we get from the CTC. Then we need to let delineate the line around the tumor as well as around the normal structures. And that's when we get the toxicities of the lung radiotherapy because all these structures are so close by. Here is the esophagus right beside the tumor. There is no way to treat this tumor and sparing the esophagus completely. So patients may get problem with swallowing, may have sore throat and or difficulty swallowing. Here we have heart and vasculature. And the lung tissue, the lung is extremely sensitive to radiation. And we can create some scar tissue around the area that we treat. Here there is nerve and finally spinal cord. That's why the planning process takes such a long time because we have to delineate the organs one by one and to come up with a plan to target the tumor while avoiding the normal structures. Then we run some beams. And here is the dosimetric information. Here you can see that we try our best to avoid the nerve here, a spinal cord here, and we shape the dose around the tumor, especially avoiding the other side. And while we're doing it, we actually perform image guidance, which means we actually do the CT scan every day that patient gets treatment. Patient lays down, get the treatment, but also we actually scan them to make sure that we're doing the good thing. So here, for example, this is the patient, this is the image, and we are targeting this tumor, but we don't seem to do the good job because the area that we want to treat doesn't really match the tumor, and we can see it on a daily basis. If that happens, we move the patient, we move the bed, we do some shifting to target the tumor perfectly the way that we aim to do. This is the same case. That was the original tumor, and this is the uh, the same patient after treatment, about a year and a half afterward, the tumor has responded really, really good to the treatment. And what we see here is just the scar tissue, and that's normal after radiation. So we talked about chemotherapy, we talked about radiation, but what else can help? These are all the external factors that help the patient, but there are all other factors that uh, patients can do to help. Uh, for example, if the patients maintain their weight, if they eat well, drink well, then obviously they can fight this cancer better way. We know that patients who actually have lost weight, they don't do as well as the patients who maintain their weight. Also, physical activities. We know that patients who, who actually can do physical activities because most of these patients are very tired and they have problems with breathing, etc., etc. But if they actually can perform some physical activities on a daily basis, then there are some studies that have shown these patients actually do better. And finally, stop smoking. I cannot emphasize on the importance of stop smoking. Many patients may say, you know what, I'm not supposed to smoke, so I don't get cancer. I have cancer. What's a big deal? I can just continue smoking. I have cancer anyway. Um, the reason that we ask patients to stop smoking is the fact that when they don't smoke, they eat better. So automatically, it helps the weight. Also, when they don't smoke, they get oxygen to the lung parenchyma as well as to the tumor. <coughs> It's been shown that if the tumors get enough oxygen, it becomes more sensitive to both radiation and chemotherapy, and these patients do better in terms of outcome. Also, the normal structures do better, so these patients actually have less side effects. Therefore, I advise every single patient of mine to stop smoking, and there are many, many help available. We have a smoke cessation program at South Lake Hospital. We have a smoke cessation hotline. The family doctors can help. But uh, I advise almost in every single clinic to make sure that they stop smoking. So in conclusion, patients with lung cancer need to be seen by oncologists chemo doctor, surgeon, radiation oncologist, and palliative care doctor who also deals with the symptoms with medications. Many patients, unfortunately, cannot be treated for cure intent, but they still can be treated to obtain the very good local control and hopefully to control their symptoms. 
um, and each patient is different and it should be looked really like as individual patient because every single tumor is different and the patient is different. Okay, thank you very much and now we're happy to take any question. So, there are lung lesions that they may come from uterus cancer, that's for sure. Sometimes with pathology, with the sample that we get from the tumor, the pathologists are actually able to tell this is coming from lung rather than uterus, they can say that. And, uh, but at the end, if they call it a stage four, either uterus going to the lung or lung going to the uterus, is a spread of the cancer. And in those cases, we cannot cure the cancer. The aim of treatment becomes to improve overall survival, to improve outcome or symptoms. But eventually, we cannot get rid of the cancer. But as Dr. Angela mentioned, many, many of these cancers cannot be cured anyway, even when they come as a stage two or three. That's I totally agree with you. We do not really need to focus on stage four as the word stage four, because some of the patients with stage four may do actually better than some of the patients with stage three. But at the end of the day, yes, it could come as secondary cancer from uterus, but usually pathologists can tell. Is there a chance of getting lung cancer? Probably not. Short answer. Yeah. <laughs> you probably never acquired any therapy for your sarcoid. Have you just watched it? Yeah, probably not. It's a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So lung cancer is actually multifactorial disease, and smoking is just one of the factors. Happen to be the most important factor. So if I want to give you the number, I would say about 60 to 70 percent of patients who smoke, they may have lung cancer. But if you look at the lung cancer population, almost 90 percent of them smoke in part of their life. About 10 percent may never smoke or they may be just light smoker. But as you said, yes, there are multiple factors. Some of them we know, some of them we don't know. Asbestosis, pollution in the air, genetic factors. There are many, many out there. Age, gender, but there are factors that we don't know. People talk about stress, people talk about tension, and so on and so forth. But what we can prevent is a smoking. There are other factors that we don't know and we cannot prevent. That's why we focus on a smoking, because that's a factor that we have the hands on and we can control. Can you take that? <laughs> it's controversial. Uh, there have been studies that show in a particular high-risk population, there may be benefit, but the issue is the screening techniques are CAT scans and multiple CAT scans, and then you're, there's special CAT scans where they dial down the radiation. But I, I would, the, the answer I would give you is no. The, uh, the, in even, even serial chest x-rays in people who are at higher risk, and you know, higher risk means you're a heavy smoker, for example, uh, or asbestos exposure and other things. Um, but it's, it's been difficult to show benefit. And again, there's only been, there's one study that showed some benefit using an awful lot of CAT scans, and the practicality and the editorials around this article when it was published not so long ago revolved around the practicality of implementing that in the U.S. health care environment. They basically said it was impossible <laughs> to do, so, so it, it's, it's not something that we routinely do. So what I can also add to this, screening as like mammogram that you do on everyone to hope to find something in someone, we don't do the same for lung cancer. But symptom-specific tests, we do that. So let's say uh, an old man who used to smoke heavily and now has cough and shortness of breath and the symptoms don't get better with antibiotic. This patient should have chest x-ray and should have perhaps a CT scan just to make sure there is nothing else going on. But as Dr. Angela said, we don't do the test just every year to make sure there is nothing happening. Uh, it tends to be local. So as, as a lump gets bigger in the chest, it can press on airways and make you shorter breath, make you cough, and you may cough up blood. And the bigger it gets, then you start losing weight and things like that. But if you just look at a chest x-ray where a tumor is growing, tends to be local, so pain, shortness of breath, cough. 
are probably the three most common. The problem with lung cancer is when it starts to cause a lot of symptoms, often it's more advanced and then it becomes difficult. Not always, but um, that, that's one of the challenges of, 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 of this disease. Now, so in the, in the setting where we're treating incurable non-small cell lung cancer, we use the term metastatic or locally advanced. Um, it's, just, it's just been shown that giving four rounds of chemo, so a round of chemo takes about three weeks, and generally beyond four, but, and definitely not beyond six, uh, once a tumor has been knocked down a little bit, hammering more chemotherapy doesn't help a whole lot. Um, it does cause cumulative toxicity for the patient. It can affect the kidneys, nerves, a variety of things. So it's with a lot of experience, it's just been shown that four and, and, de and definitely not more than six is where you, you tend to stop most of the time for intravenous chemotherapy. The pills are different. Our, the paradigm is shifting a little bit. But generally, when we treat someone, we'll give them four cycles, they'll respond, then we'll watch them, and then we'll restart treatment again when the tumors start to grow again. There is something called maintenance therapy where you treat someone for four to six rounds and then switch drugs and keep giving them chemotherapy. My experience with this is after four to six rounds of chemo, which uh, is about 12 to 16, 12 to 18 weeks of treatment, a lot of patients say, you know, thanks, doc, I'm going to take a break. I'll see you in two months. We'll get a chest x-ray and reserve treatment for when I need it again. And most patients want to go that route. Okay. And then the, would the same chemo be successful starting up again? Or do you Good question. It depends how long the chemotherapy worked the first time. And generally, we tend to use six months as this arbitrary if it worked less than six months versus more than six months. But what also comes into play is, uh, is the tolerability of that chemotherapy previously? Did they sail through it? Did they have problems? Have you heard yet? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what can you do for the weakness? My mom, she has to do things, but of course she's so weak. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. The majority of patients have this problem, and unfortunately that's one of the most difficult problems they have to face with because they want to do the things, they just don't, don't have enough energy. Um, there are medications, there are non-medical things to do. Non-medical things to do, rest whenever she really needs to rest, and when she feels that she has energy, she can do as much as she can do without making herself too tired. Unfortunately, sometimes patients just overdo. When they have energy, they just do a lot, then they become double tired. We usually ask them to take it easy. When they have energy, don't just use it in two minutes. Start slowly and don't overdo it. And of course, try to eat better. They usually have low appetite. We ask them to take over-the-counter boost or ensure. Eating better also helps their energy. But there are medications also which may help, but any medication comes with some side effects. So there is always the balance between these two. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.